you have to excuse me, I'm a little dry this morning. My wife has my car. My wife is out of town this morning. She has the car, so I walked here this morning, and I'm, uh, I'm suffering mightily for it. Last week, last week we took a look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. And last week, we kind of talked about how understanding Jesus' words within the context of all Scripture, understanding Jesus' words, not in isolation, but within the context of all Scripture, gives His followers the, pers- the perspective needed the perspective that we need to live in freedom, not fear. I happened to like that one last week, and so it seemed to also have struck a chord with a couple of people here, so we're going to sort of follow up with something similar today. We'll be in Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 13 this morning, and if you've got a Bible with you, I invite you to turn there now. If you have a phone with you, by all means, open up a Bible app and go there yourself. I'd love to have people follow along with this. And as you're making your way there, I want to open up this morning with a bit of an illustration. Now, this is going to sound mean, and it's because it is. There are some people in this world who insist on making things more difficult than they need to be. And if you don't know anybody who makes that, you're probably that person. (laughs) A while back, I was involved in a church renovation that included upgrading a soundboard and the video equipment and this, a bunch of technical stuff that, frankly, I know nothing about, but I pretend to because it gives people confidence. We hired someone to come in and help us with the upgrades, and this guy, he came in, and he was an expert. Like, he was one of those, like, quintessential tech guys. You just saw him, and you knew immediately, like, this guy knows tech. And he came in, he helped us with the upgrades, and I think I understood about 23% of the words that he used the whole time he was there. I like to think of myself as a moderately tech-savvy person. I have a smartwatch, I have a smartphone, I know what a computer is. But this guy full, spoke full-on nerd. And when I would ask for instructions or clarifications, he didn't give me, like, layman's terms for every, anything. He got more technical for some reason that I can't understand. Like, like, you know how if you're, like, in a different country or if you see somebody who doesn't speak English and how you think that going and saying words louder might communicate what you're trying to say? That's how he approached me. It was so frustrating that I finally gave up on the idea of ever understanding this guy because he refused to speak plain English. However, there was another person who worked on that project with us, another person that we brought in. And it was a wonderful experience to work with him because he spoke to me like a human being. He understood all these big technical things. He understood all, those, uh, all, all the technical terms. He knew all of the acronyms. He knew all of the different parts that we needed. He was a, an expert in every way. But he used words and metaphors and similes and things like that to actually help me understand what was actually going on, how stuff worked, and why it worked. He was wonderful to work with. Now, to be fair, I had to look into something. Like, he gave me homework. That's actually part of the reason why it worked. He gave me homework, and he said, listen, if you really want to understand this, look at this, 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 and this. I had to do some work in order to really get a better grasp on what was going on. But that guy made my life a lot easier because he didn't show off his knowledge or make me feel dumb for asking questions. He didn't withhold anything. He just cleared up the confusion by explaining how and why things worked. Two very, very different experiences on the same job. Have you ever been in a situation where it seemed like someone who was meant to teach or guide you was withholding information for some reason? Whether it was to lord their superiority over you or just because they honestly didn't understand how you couldn't understand this? If you have, you know how frustrating and confusing it can be. So why is it that when we look at Scripture, it seems like that's exactly what Jesus seems to do with the crowds sometimes? Why is it that when we look at Jesus' ministry, we see him seeming to not speak plainly to the people around him? 
When he spoke, when he spoke to huge crowds he fo- that followed him around, like Jesus gathered crowds from everywhere. And most of it happened because he was a miracle worker. People loved to see that going on. They wanted to be a part of that. When he spoke to the huge crowds that followed him around, he would often teach in stories and parables that for many people in the crowds, even his disciples, these stories and parables were difficult to decipher. What does he mean by that? So a natural question for anyone reading the Gospels is, if Jesus was trying to teach people about God and salvation from sin, then why did he bury his teaching in stories? Why did he bury his teaching in parables? Why would he do this? And that's actually a good question that the disciples asked Jesus. If you take a look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 10, you see that. His disciples came to him and asked, Why do you use parables when you talk to the people? Why are you burying the lead? Why are you doing this? It's a good question. It's a fair question. And in the following verses, after they've asked this this question, Jesus explains to them why he seems to bury his message in parables. Now, as we're examining Jesus' answer, we're going to go through the rest of the verses together, and we're going to examine Jesus' answer together. But as we're go- examining his answer to this pa- in this passage, as we're examining his answer to the disciples' question, I want to keep something in mind that I think is important to understand, something that we need to have the front of, at the front of our minds in order to make sure that we've got this in perspective. At the end of it, Jesus invites committed people to dig deeper. As we're examining this answer, we need to remember this. Jesus invites committed people to dig deeper. Now, Jesus Jesus isn't exclusive about who can follow him. He doesn't hold tryouts. He's not somebody who's going to go and say, "Eh, no. He's not exclusive about who can follow him, but he does have high requirements of the ones who do choose to follow him. And we talked about this a little bit before, and I hope anyone who's been in church long enough knows that being a disciple is not meant to be a casual thing. It's not meant to be this this casual membership that you can come out of and come back into at your leisure. It's not like a Costco membership where you can leave and uh, reapply whenever it suits you. Jesus is looking for people willing to commit fully to him And that requires some work on our part. Jesus does not have anything to hide. And he invites people to come to him and find out more about what he's talking about. With that in mind, I want to take a look at his answer to the disciples in verses 11 through 13. We're going to go through the whole thing, then we're going to split it up into two parts, and we're going to follow it up. So his disciples asked him, Why do you use parables when you talk to the people? And Jesus replied, You, my followers, my close followers, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That is why I use these parables, for they look but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. As we get into this, as we're looking at that answer, this twofold answer that Jesus has, there are two elements of his answer that we need to understand as we're going through this. And that's, what are these secrets of his kingdom that he's talking about? And why... Why would he bury his teaching in these parables? Why would he bury his teaching in stories and parables? So what are these secrets that he's talking about, and why bury, why bury the lead? Why bury your teaching? I'm going to start by examining these secrets of the, of the kingdom. He refers to secrets of the kingdom. I'm going to read verse 11 for you one more time. Jesus replied, You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. This gets a little bit cloak and dagger. This feels strange. 
When I think of something that involves secret knowledge or some kind of privileged in- information, people walking around with privileged information, I get a picture in my mind of like hidden rooms behind revolving walls and people in hoods gathered around large tables by candlelight. These Illuminati type organizations or something like that. And that might just be because I watched too many episodes of Scooby-Doo as a kid. I don't know. But I, hopefully you get the point. It's this idea, the idea of secret knowledge, the idea of the secrets of the kingdom gives way to this picture of secret societies and hard truths that are just too much for the masses. They can't handle the truth. So until they're initiated fully, we're not giving it to them. It's privileged information that is only given to insiders, and Jesus seems to confirm this when he says that his followers are permitted to understand the secrets or mysteries of his kingdom. So, what's the secret that he's referring to? What is he talking about? What are these secrets of the kingdom? Find out that, you can uh, pay me about five bucks, and I'm willing to tell you. That's not true. I'm not going to do that. What are these secrets that he's referring to? Oddly, it's something that's really not a secret in the Gospels. It's something that Jesus had proclaimed over and over and over again, but that not everybody caught on to. The secret that Jesus reveals is something that he spoke over and over again, but not everybody caught on to it. The kingdom of heaven had arrived. Here's the big secret. The kingdom is here now. But it looked nothing like the arrival people were expecting. The big secret was the wait for God's arrival was over. Heaven is not something that followers of Jesus need to pine and wait for. Although we have a hope of heaven, we experience the presence of God now. It's not something that we have to hope and pine for in the future. It's something we experience now. It was something that Jesus made very clear in his teaching, and so it feels like a bit of a misnomer. Or like it, it feels like we're mislabeling this thing to call it secrets. But the reality is that not everyone who heard Jesus' message understood it fully. That's what qualifies it as secret knowledge, not that it's withheld, not that the information is not there, but that Jesus gives meaning and clarity to that teaching. It's there for you if you just listen and understand. Now, we've touched on this before, but it's worth looking into again. By and large, the religious leaders and the people of Israel had a picture of what it would look like when God established his kingdom among them. It's part of the reason why people did not pick up what Jesus was throwing down. Why some people did not understand his message. They had a totally different expectation of what this coming kingdom was supposed to look like. They believed that Israel would be restored to political, economical, and military prominence. Political, economical, military, religious, all these things, Israel would be restored to its former glory. They were looking for God, God's power to confirm their picture of what power and restoration looked like. But when Jesus arrived and said that the kingdom had arrived with him, it looked nothing like what they had pictured. The actual... looking into this this week as we're looking through commentaries and other things, the word that we use to actually describe God's kingdom as it arrived through Jesus, we use the word clandestine. The word clandestine, clandestine refers to something that is understated or that moves and acts under the radar because it opposes the existing powers around it. The secret of God's clandestine kingdom is that power comes from submission. And the only way to make sense of that is to be a committed follower of Jesus. It flies in the face of what our picture of power, glory, all those different things look like. Power doesn't come through conquest in God's kingdom. 
In God's kingdom, power comes through submission to Him. And the only way to make sense of it is to be a committed follower of Jesus. When Jesus arrived on earth, He did not bust down doors. He didn't announce Himself to the great kings and emperors of His time. And He didn't come in overwhelming power. His arrival, it was, a grand, it was a grand announcement, don't get me wrong, an angelic choir coming out is nothing to sneeze at, but it didn't come to the people in power. Jesus' arrival was announced to the outcasts, to poor shepherds and foreigners. And he was born to humble parents in a stable, not in a grand palace. He possessed divine power and authority, but he set it aside to be fully committed to the will of his Father and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He didn't demonstrate the power of his kingdom through acts of domination and authority. He didn't come in pushing everybody out of the way and driving out armies. The way that he demonstrated his power was through acts of healing and mercy, acts of service. Healing the sick, casting out demons, providing food. Acts of service, not domination. Jesus preached a countercultural kingdom that valued submission to God above all else. The greatest in Jesus' kingdom are the ones who realize their need for God. The leaders in his kingdom are servants, not tyrants. The power of his kingdom is demonstrated in the restoration of sinful people. And the ones who belong to his kingdom are the humble. And that's why he says that his followers are permitted to understand the secrets of his kingdom. None of that stuff makes sense outside of following Jesus. That's not what power looks like in our world. None of that makes sense without following Jesus. The church, we need to understand something. When Jesus is referring to these secrets of the kingdom, we need to understand that the church is not in possession of some confidential secret. We don't have privileged information that we're hiding from anybody. And you don't need to reach a certain level of commitment before you're finally let out on the real deal. None of that. We've just been given the context necessary to understand the message of the gospel. We've been given Jesus. That's why Jesus says that by listening to his teaching, his followers are given an abundance of knowledge, while the people who didn't listen, listen lose whatever, whatever they may have gleaned from the teaching. It just becomes nice stories, good morals. The secret of God's kingdom is is that it has arrived with Jesus and that the power of his kingdom is displayed in salvation, not domination. Jesus teaches that the only way to understand that secret, that mystery of the gospel, is to be in fellowship with him. So now we've seen that Jesus is not withholding information or keeping secrets. So if that's the case, then the next question is the same one that the the disciples asked. If you want people to know about your kingdom, if you want people to know about the, like, if you want people to understand this mystery, if you want people to understand what it is that you're teaching and what you're calling them to, then why not just speak plainly? Why not just tell them plainly? Why are you burying your teaching in parables? I'm going to look at verses 12 and 13 to see what Jesus' answer is to that. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That is why I use these parables. For they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. I have a friend, I have a, for some of you that's surprising, <laughs> but I have a friend who applied to be a city police officer in Edmonton a few years ago. 
Now, he absolutely, this guy absolutely fits the bill for somebody who I can see doing that kind of thing. Just aside from the fact that he's about this tall, he fits the bill for city cop. He's adventurous, he's athletic, and he's already volunteered with the fire department for years. He's someone who loves to help and serve people. That's where his heart comes from. He's not looking for the badge. He's not looking for the gun. He's looking for an opportunity to serve people in a unique way. Now, as he prepared for the application process, he assumed that he knew what he was getting into. And without giving too much away, because this is information that I'm sure that recruiters probably don't want spread around too much, without giving too much away, the training process was nothing like he thought it was going to be. It was downright harsh. It nearly drove him away. Not because of the physical toll, but because of the mental toll that it took on him. Everything about EPS training <clears throat> is designed to do two things. It's designed to prepare you for what you will encounter, whether that be speeders, whether that be jaywalkers, or whether that be a domestic situation. It is designed to prepare you for what you might run into, and it tests each recruit and their commitment to becoming a police officer. If you're going to make it through this training, you have got to want it. Days as a city cop are not all pleasant. There are days that are life-threatening and thankless on that job. Police are constantly meeting people on their worst day, and if you don't want to be there, you're not going to last. Or worse, you may end up in a situation where you can get yourself or someone else seriously hurt or killed. If you're going to be involved in this, you have to want it. The application and training process are designed to ensure that the ones who do make it to the end are both competent you can train anybody to be competent. But it's also designed to wean out the ones who don't want to be there for the right reasons. It's, there, it's designed to ensure that the ones who do make it to the end want to be there and have the competence to do the job well. Jesus illustrated that the nature of his kingdom, or sorry, Jesus illustrated the nature of his kingdom through parables and stories so that the people who actually wanted to find out more, the people who actually wanted to follow him, would seek further clarity from him. Again, you have to understand that Jesus wasn't exactly withholding information from anybody with these stories. It's illustrated right there. As a matter of fact, if you go uh, just a little bit further down, you'll see that Jesus actually goes and explains the parable that he just went through uh, with his disciples. He's more than willing to explain what all this stuff means. He's not withholding in, in the information. But his teaching and parables were designed to be an invitation to come and find out more. If it grabs you, you're going to approach him. We'll see later on that there were many people who were drawn to Jesus because of his miracles. You see that throughout the rest of the gospel. But many of them were not ready to accept the message of his kingdom. They weren't ready to accept the message that your idea of power is not what God's kingdom desires or values as power. Your desire for your nation is not what God desires for your nation. Your, your desire for your life is not necessarily what God desires for your life. There were a lot of people who were not ready to accept that message. They wanted the benefits of power on their terms, and because of that, they were not able to understand the true nature of Jesus' teaching on their own. So here's the deal. Nothing in God's kingdom is done in isolation. It's always done in relationship with God. We're not meant to understand this on our own. We are meant to understand this in fellowship with God. 
In John 5, Jesus says to his followers that he only ever did what he saw the Father doing. He didn't act on his own. He didn't go around doing this stuff on his own. Do you think that the cross was his own idea? He followed the will of the Father. He lived, his, he lived daily by the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. So why should his followers expect to understand the mystery of his kingdom or do the work of his kingdom without being in fellowship with him? His parables were an intentional way of drawing people in who were ready to follow his lead and rely on him for the power to do kingdom work. His parables, his teaching, why would you bury the lead? To draw people in so that they could understand his kingdom teaching and be given purpose and power to do kingdom work through fellowship with him. Jesus' parables were not a barrier to keep out the unworthy. They're an invitation to approach him to find out more. Back in December, I shared one of the passages that drew me to want to do this walk through the gospel together with you. It's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says that my grace is all that you need. My power works best in weakness. The secret of Jesus' kingdom is made clear when we're ready to humble ourselves before him. His parables are a taste of the goodness he will reveal in full when we are in close fellowship with him. He doesn't withhold anything from anyone who will approach him and ask. The power and the splendor of his kingdom are only hidden from people by their own pride. God's kingdom, understanding God's kingdom, participating in God's kingdom, requires intimate fellowship with Jesus. And so he invites his followers through his teaching and parables to come to him and dig deeper. We're going to be gathering around the Lord's table together this morning. And I think that doing communion, coming together and remembering these elements, looking at these elements and remembering Jesus, I think that communion is a perfect response to the message this morning. I'm going to ask for those who are serving to please come forward now. The bread and the cup that represent the broken body and shed blood of Jesus are a reminder of the upside-down nature of God's kingdom. Victory over sin and death were won by Jesus when he appeared to be utterly defeated. The nature of that victory is not like anything that we see in our world. It was not won by conquest or a display of strength. It was one when Jesus submitted himself in obedience to the will of the Father and paid the debt that we could not pay. The wisdom of the world cannot understand that kind of victory. And so the world rejects it. Only when we approach Jesus in humility can we understand and partake in his victory over sin. As we approach the communion, communion table today, I want to invite you to reflect on the great mystery that the elements represent. By the humble and loving sacrifice of Jesus, victory over sin and death are made available to anyone who will come to him in humble faith. Our practice here at Alberta Beach Alliance Church is that we have a single package when it comes to communion. There are two cups.